Um, when we started talking about how do age, how do the how does industry learn from each other, we started to talk about you know what sometimes we look too inwardly within our own space. So how do other industries do it? And one of the things that we talked about was you know Toyota, their reputation, their legacy for quality, and how do they look at some of the things and some of the challenges that we have that we face every day, but from a totally different perspective. And some, some folks look at industry from the perspective of, well, that's automotive and that's just different. Well, guess what? It, a lot of it isn't. And so Kristen's gonna help us sort of frame the perspective of how other industries do it. And then we'll have a panel that will talk about um, sort of how are we doing it and how does it overlap or how can we learn from, from other parts of the industry? So with that, Kristen. Thank um, you. Somewhat of an introduction, That's not perfect. quite no introduction, That's but a, somewhat. That's perfect. Absolutely so perfect. Kristen's here for us, and um, I just, again, we look forward to the engagement today, and we encourage you guys to ask questions, take things back with you, but at the end of the day, it's going to be about how do we continue to move this movement forward. Thank you. I think this is my clicker. <coughs> Thank you for that excellent introduction. Um, I kind of talk loud, but I guess I'll use the microphone. Can everyone hear me okay? So uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, no problem. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Tabar. Uh, I'm a vice president at Toyota in charge of quality. Um, and I'm so happy to be here today to be able to share a little bit of our uh, insight or background on quality. Um, based on the comments that were made just before I came up, I think uh, I have something maybe that will help you kind of hopefully inspire you as you work through the day today in your workshops this afternoon. And um, give you just a little bit of insight as was mentioned, uh, the commonalities between automotive and medical device, or for that matter, any other industry related to quality. So to start with uh, today, I just have a couple of topics to go through. Honestly, this is very informal. Um, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation, after the presentation, so don't feel like you have to wait until the end. You can raise your hand, I'm happy to do that. Um, but today, I'll just give you a quick introduction uh, for those of you who maybe don't know um, some of the details about Toyota, especially in North America. I wanna give you just a little preface to that. Um, I will. Uh, walk you through a little bit of our uh, dark times of quality uh, with our recall crisis, uh, just to give you some background of how we approached that, which was a very serious time for us. And then I'll take you through our quality strategy, um, some of the big uh, key areas of that and how we use it um, on a daily basis. So this is me um, when I had straighter hair. Um, I've been uh, at Toyota for 26 years. I just celebrated my 26 year anniversary last month. Um, I've had lots of different uh, roles at the company, but honestly, primarily I've worked in our R&D area, uh, which was the first 25 years. Uh, most recently, I've taken an assignment down in our headquarters, which I'll talk about in a second. But I started my career in our electronics area um, right out of college. So I've grown up at the company um, and been drinking the Kool-Aid since I got out of school. So um, I really do love the company. It's a great, really great place. Um, I moved into various areas of electronics. I launched our uh, North American telematics or infotainment systems. Um, I did have a special assignment during the recall crisis, which I'll talk about just a little bit. And uh, then I moved into a completely different area, uh, mostly administrative, but for our R&D leg. Um, managing everything from HR, accounting and finance, all of those functions. Then uh, strategy and planning, also for R&D, trying to decide which projects and work we should take on, um, which research projects and development projects. And then as I mentioned, most recently I uh, have a position now uh, at our headquarters in the quality organization. So in that role, currently I'm responsible for um, all of the quality of all the vehicles that are produced in North America. 
um, and making sure that they meet all the standards before they go to the customers and to market. So um, before I get started, I wanted to introduce to you just a little bit, um, and I think it fits quite well based on the discussion, again, the comments just before I came up. Uh, Toyota launched a campaign for those of you who are Super Bowl fans. You probably saw the campaign during the uh, Super Bowl and the Olympics this past winter. And uh, this is a new global campaign for us. Uh, based on our sponsorship of the Olympics coming up in 2020, which will be held in Tokyo. And so um, the, the theme of the uh, campaign is Start Your Impossible. So we are sponsors of not only the Olympics, but the Paralympics and Special Olympics as well. And really, this was kind of a uh, springboard for us to think about um, how to transform our own company as we look at the industry that's changing from primarily automotive <clears throat> to a much broader mobility type uh, industry and our products and services need to change accordingly. So although it's uh, meant to, of course, um, sort of get people and customers familiar with the brand and some of our um, great new products currently coming out, it's also meant to be internal. Um, how can we spur on that innovation creativity and kind of think about preparing for that next future. And that's really a message I think that can be applicable even you know, today as you come here. Um, although I don't want you to think what you're trying to do is impossible, um, although you may think it's impossible or some of you may think it's impossible, certainly um, maybe struggling with, but internally we use it for those projects where we're, you know, we're having a hard time transitioning, we're having a hard time thinking a little bit differently and it's sort of that inspiration or call to action internally. So I thought I'd share just a little bit of that with you today in the video. I've been chasing a road to glory, driven since I was a child. Tell you life is a game, but it ain't a game to me. The lights are calling my name. Yeah, I got the energy to put it all on the line. When we're free to move, anything is possible. So for Toyota, we kind of used that again. Um, it's hard to not be a little inspired when you see that. Um, Lauren's amazing, and she's uh, working with us a lot on, uh, of course, Olympics and Paralympics. But again, it's very uh, motivational when you think about some of the hard projects you're looking at internally um, to see the struggle that she's gone through and other athletes like her. Um, it really gets you excited to try and break through and um, challenge your own impossible. Um, also, I thought I'd share with you just a little bit. Uh, we did hit some big milestones in Toyota uh, this past year. We've had uh, operations in the United States for quite a long time, um, but I don't know if all of you realize just how long. So um, our sales and marketing leg have actually been in the United States operations for the last 80 years. Um, our uh, Toyota Motor Manufacturing is celebrating its 60th anniversary last year. And then our R&D center, which is where I came from, was our 40th anniversary. So um, it actually, we've been established uh, in the North American operations for quite some time. Uh, and if you look at even a little more closely, some of our numbers here in North America, just to give you some perspective, this is North American numbers only. Uh, so we have quite a lot of employees. You can see direct investment is quite large, 23 billion. Direct employment, of almost 140,000. That includes our manufacturing, R&D, of course, everything. <clears throat> almost 33 million, 
33 billion, excuse me, in purchasing, and of course, uh, 25 million vehicles sold since uh, produced. Sorry, produced since uh, we started operations. So, um, again, just to give you some perspective on Toyota's size, I know a lot of people think Toyota and it's mostly Japan, but actually, it's quite a large footprint right here in the states. Um, we also undertook in the last recent time um, a complete restructuring of the company. So um, as I mentioned, we kind of grew up those three separate entities, sales, marketing, manufacturing, and R&D. But um, we decided to really restructure the whole operations to blend those together into one Toyota company, one common company. This just shows you a little bit of our um, preparation and how we approached that to try and harmonize across those entities that were previously separate companies, but now coming together under one, one company. Um, we started with, of course, our common culture. Um, that's a big issue for us, a big uh, foundational point that we really stress. And you'll hear that again and again today as we talk about some of the quality items. Um, everything kind of comes back to that common culture. As you can see, it's based on the Toyota way, shown there on the left-hand side. Um, and basically, uh, it's the two fundamental pillars of continuous improvement and respect for people. Um, that branches out into the five pillars, challenge, kaizen, genshi genbutsu, respect, and teamwork. So um, for those of you who aren't Japanese savvy, of course, kaizen is uh, continuous improvement. And Genshi Genbutsu is roughly uh, translated as kind of go and see, go to the place where the work is being done. So again, we developed this to have that common framework amongst all of our members as we restructured our organization and tried to build on some efficiencies of getting us all working together uh, towards common goals. What that actually meant was we took our disparate, uh, three disparate operations and we were able to um, reconfigure them uh, and recombine them into what you see here, which are three major um, sites. The first being uh, the smallest in Michigan, that's our R&D site. Um, then in Kentucky, we centralized all of our manufacturing kind of headquarters, of course, the manufacturing plants are still located in the main states that they were. And then our headquarters uh, relocated from both the West Coast and the East Coast into uh, the Dallas area. So all of the corporate functions are now located there in Dallas. That's where uh, we are located and the quality function is listed there. <coughs> Next, I'd like to talk just a little bit about our recall. Um, this was a, a little bit of a, I'll say, kind of a dark time for Toyota in the United States. Um, I think it's a good example, though, of how we approached um, quality and how we kind of learned from this big incident. So um, just to give you, again, a little bit of background about what was happening or refresh your memory if you didn't live through it like we did. Um, so in the... Uh, late 2009, uh, there was an accident, a uh, fatal accident, vehicle accident. Um, and the uh, cause of the accident was reported as unintended acceleration. So um, what, we, what we came to know from that, of course, was uh, we, after some investigation that we did on the vehicles, uh, we had some issues with our floor mats, uh, if you re remember the uh, floor mats were kind of catching the pedal and holding the pedal down so that the car would accelerate without your foot being on the pedal. So we did end up doing several recalls uh, for floor mats as well as uh, some pedals, as you can see there. And that was uh, early 2010. And then of course, uh, we had the testimony in uh, February by our CEO. Um, this is the really simple story of what happened, uh, but when we were in it uh, at the time, and for those of you who re remember, um, it was kind of every day, especially here in Washington, if you were in Washington, D.C., every day the newspapers were coming out, every day it was on the news. Um, I think you can maybe imagine from uh, the company's perspective, from the employees, 
it was a really hard time. Um, we were really proud of the work we had been doing in the States. We were really proud of the vehicles and uh, parts that we were putting out to the market. And we were really confident that um, we had found the, the problems, you know, clearly. But there was a lot of buzz and noise around electronics, if you recall. So, and that was, of course, my area. And so, um, to try and counteract that and try to balance some of the um, heavy, heavy news media and print media and congressional media, everything was happening. Uh, we decided that we were going to kind of take the stance and try to get our story out to the public and explain to them what was really happening in a way that maybe they could understand. Uh, electronics always has sort of that um, mystery of, I don't understand it, I don't get how it works. So um, we wanted to really make sure that it, the systems that they were talking about weren't really that complicated. And so we were able to you know, talk about those in a way that helped the public understand what was really happening and really what was not happening, um, despite the media hype that was happening all around them. But as you can see, the of course, there was a lot of things. Uh, the brand, of course, was taking a big hit in reputation. Again, news media all over the place. We were testifying continuously um, and holding news conferences and all kinds of things. That uh, was my role during that time, which was to try and explain some of that electronics. Um, I did lots and lots of news articles, TV interviews, testified in front of Congress, reported to Academy of Sciences, all kinds of different things to try and um, explain what was really happening and again, what was really not happening. This is just a quick clip of one of the interviews that we gave, that I gave. The most important thing to us is to understand what's going on with the vehicle. If there's a problem on the vehicle, we want to understand what's happening and we want to fix it as quickly as possible. The customer satisfaction and their expectations for how the vehicle should operate are very important to us and that's what we want to make sure is correct. So at Toyota, we rigorously test our electronics. We test both um, at a part and a vehicle level and we test in a lab or a chamber and on the road. Our chamber environments allow us to test the vehicle under conditions that you would never see in a real world environment. Um, we have eight chambers uh, located in Japan that we can put the entire vehicle in. We run it on what we call a dyno um, that allows us to operate the vehicle just as it would be on the regular roads. We power up the whole car and we operate all the electronics in the vehicle and then we bombard it with all kinds of interferences that would normally cause parts to maybe operate abnormally or fail and then we make sure that every system in the vehicle operates properly under those conditions. I've worked for Toyota for a long time, almost 20 years, and I have a lot of knowledge about our design and evaluation and I'm very confident in the quality of the products we're putting out there. So um, that's just a quick clip, but what I guess I want you to kind of take away from that as you think about it, um, it, it may seem a little disconnected from what we're talking about here today, but I want you to think about um, if the situation was for one of your devices and there was a, you know, some claim that there was something happening um, and how you would react. You know that you have rigor around your processes and your quality and your products um, and your employees know that as well. And so when there's claims or accusations that there's something seriously going wrong. Um, you need to make sure that you can get your, your story out there and really take the opportunity to examine what they're saying about your product um, and make sure that you, are you really looking at it? Are you kind of seeing it through the jaded glasses? Um, and I think that's what led us to this next step, which is um, as part of the the whole recall process towards the end, as you can see on the timeline, we were um, part of a deferred prosecuting uh, agreement and we had a monitor 
uh, from our regulators uh, that was installed in our operations in North America for three years. Um, so this probably sounds horrible. Um, and at first, we probably thought it was going to be horrible. Um, but honestly speaking, uh, it, was a, it was a fairly small team, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 of them that you know, worked with the, the specified monitor. But um, the, the terms of the agreement were complete unfettered access, anything on demand. So, um, and we were very happy and open to do that. Um, quite frankly, the early days of those discussions were, you know, we, we really were taking this as an opportunity to have a fresh eyes look at all of our documentation, all of our processes, all of our check procedures, all of the things that um, we thought secured quality in our own minds and help us understand where there may be some weak points or some flaws. Um, and so honestly, we let them, uh, you know, they'd come in in the morning and say, okay, tomorrow we wanna go here. Okay, so that's where we would go documents and reviews all day with those members. And um, we found a lot of good information from this kind of uh, deep dive review and sort of spot checking all different assets and all different aspects of the company. Um, so although, again, you may think, oh, monitor and regulation and um, how that would be so disruptive to your business. Um, and again, of course, there is some of that, but the primary thing for us was really looking at how we could learn from, again, that kind of fresh eyes look at all of our operations and see the things that maybe we were missing. That's probably our biggest learning point from the recall. Um, what we really realized were, of course, there's some items that came from the monitorship that we've you know, been working through and correcting. Um, but the biggest thing we recognize is that we were, and I think you mentioned it today, a little too inward looking. So we weren't listening enough to what our customers were telling us. We weren't listening to their feedback to us to understand what they thought quality was, as opposed to how we were defining it. And so um, it really taught us and kind of allowed us to go back to that um, very basic fundamental Toyota way of respect for people and continuous improvement. We had maybe lost a little bit of that and we recognized it through this crisis. And now for the last nine years since that happened, um, the company has really completely rededicated itself to every day um, remembering that and using that experience to improve our quality continuously. <coughs> Next. Yes, please. Um, so, and I appreciate uh, what we're probably going to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got a specific, that's a weird echo. Okay. A specific, uh, you know, a subsystem for corrective and preventive actions. That's something that'll come up a little later today. Um, Thank you. How would you guys, or how do you guys handle internally that construct around corrective and preventive actions, um, the system, how, how burdensome is it? And then how does a situation like this get tackled? Hmm, that's a good question. So um, we do have a, a fairly robust system for corrective action. Um, it's not just fixing the problem. Um, our system, of course, goes about trying to understand what we typically call it the five why uh, analysis. So, um, and a lot of people think that they do five why, but um, five why is very deep thinking. Um, you really have to get down to, we call it five, but sometimes it's eight or 10 or 15 wise. So you really have to get down to the root of what the issue is. And almost universally, it will come down to lack of process, lack of control, you know, some kind of um, missing point that you're not checking, 
not having, of course, the resource to do so or the technical knowledge that, you know, you should be checking that. But you really have to understand where that's occurring in the, the overall stream of what you're looking at for that problem. And again, we look at it from not only, um, you know, particularly the error, but we break it down by the man, method, machine, um, and management, of course, always those items. And again, do the five Y in each of those categories. So that's a very common practice that we use all the time. However, in addition to that, we have a reoccurrence prevention that always partners with the corrective action. So we can fix the problem, the immediate problem that's happening and understand why it happened. But honestly, for Toyota, the more important thing is what processes did not happen or did not exist that allowed that problem to happen? It's never really about the, the person that missed, you know, signing off or didn't do the evaluation or didn't record the number properly. It's how did that get through that person, the person who was supposed to check it, the downstream person who received that data, who didn't recognize that that data was missing or you know whatever the particular problem is. So we really do a systematic approach to that kind of reoccurrence, we call it reoccurrence prevention, to make sure that the process and thinking way is intact to prevent that same problem from happening again. Does that answer your question? A little bit. Um, the other piece, I guess the piece of that I'm trying to get a bigger context <laughs> around is, uh, because it, it really is something I think that we've heard feedback on and we're trying to see how we tackle this. How burdensome is that activity? I know we learned a little bit yesterday about the ability to stop the line or just fix mm -hmm. an issue that you've got and everything else. Does that all go into the same corrective mode? How does that get separated? You know, that reactive, let's solve these quick, easy, you know, situations, problems, let's own the fixing of these quality issues versus when does it trip into something that's a bit more formal? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, honestly, it's a little bit hard to, we don't have such strict um, parameters about when we trip into the, the more formal um, documented corrective action and reoccurrence prevention. However, um, at every level, no matter how small the problem is, that process is happening. So the kind of formal documentation of it occurs, of course, when there's, you know, impact to the market, financial impact, human impact. But, um, you know, on a daily basis, even our staff use that process, you know, a little more informally, of course, but with their peers, supervisors, and, you know, stakeholders. It's just a very common way of thinking when something happens uh, because for us, the problem is not a problem. Uh, quite honestly, I think we talked a little bit yesterday at the FTA. Um, it's a very strange culture at Toyota about problems. I, I don't find it strange because it's the only culture I've ever known, but um, people tell me that it's a little unusual. We love to find problems. Love it. Um, we celebrate finding the problems. We recognize and reward people for pulling the end on and raising a problem up. Um, for us, that is a thousand times or infinitely better than the customer finding it. So we really promote that thinking of, yep, let's look, anybody who sees a problem, no matter if it is in your area, another area, and you'll see some in, uh, examples in the slides, um, raise up the problem, be a part of the solution, be a part of the team that figures out how did that happen? How can you contribute to it not happening again? Um, how can we make sure that we don't let this happen again, that eventually a customer would get that result? So those are the kind of things that, again, it, it's so embedded in the culture, whether it's informal or formal, that's our approach to every kind of issue that we find internally. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so first I'm gonna talk just a little bit about our strategy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is really born from our Toyota Way um, philosophy, which is I think well known, uh, but anyway, the two basic pillars of continuous improvement and respect for people. And so 
Uh, that again breaks down into those five main pillars that I mentioned earlier. And this becomes the foundation. Um, quite honestly, we have the Toyota way for almost every aspect of our business. Toyota way of quality, Toyota way of purchasing, Toyota way of, this applies to every single function that we have, not just, uh, for example, manufacturing. So today I'm gonna to talk about kind of the four big phases of our quality strategy. Um, first, we start with reflection. Always, 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 we start with thinking about what's the current condition, what's the recent past history, where are we at and what do we need to remember? So as we talked about just a few minutes ago um, with the uh, recall crisis, we do use this as an opportunity to spread this culture and remember this big issue that we had with the customers on an annual basis. So every year on the anniversary of our CEO's testimony to Congress, we have activities uh, company-wide. Some are complete stand downs, some are joint um, activities with speakers, some are quality circles at the plant where they look at a certain process and try to improve it. But every person in the company on this day does some activity related to focusing on the customer and quality and remembering uh, just how big of an impact we did have on our customers. Um, the important thing here is really, uh, again, to try to put that mindset and make, especially our new members that maybe didn't work at the company at the time, who didn't go through the experience, maybe didn't feel as much pain as some of us that were there at the time, um, but help them understand that this is a part of our history. This is something that we have to be mindful of and pay attention to and uh, really incorporate into our everyday work. So again, that's each year in February. Um, we also have at each of our sites, uh, our manufacturing sites, we just are getting ready to open our new one at our headquarters. And uh, of course, globally, each site has what we call a quality learning center. So this is a room about the size of this room, this first floor here. And uh, it has a lot of displays, posters, um, actual mock-ups of parts, simulation where you can sit in a vehicle and you know there's simulated driving to try and uh, bring awareness to some of the issues that we've had in the field. So this is refreshed each year. It's updated with all of our quality metrics, all of the third party consumer survey information, any of the big issues we have globally. Of course, our site focuses on North America, Japan on Japan and so on. Um, and it shows you what kind of things flowed out, what kind of things, even though we have all this focus on quality, what kind of things did we actually still let through and what was the impact to the customer? So this helps our team members. Again, uh, they have team meetings here, they come individually, they try to learn a little bit about um, our perspective on quality and again, what kind of things were missing hopefully inspiring them to think about how to not miss them. Um, we also have some interesting uh, in the education field, which is the second pillar. Um, this is activity that we do various things throughout the year. Um, one of the big items that we focus on is building in quality. This really refers to how we approach quality in our daily work, how we try to build it in at each step along the way, and how we try to, it'll sound a little bit strange, but how we try to apply our Toyota production system even to non-production work. So really thinking about the steps that have to be done for each and every task, making sure that each task or subtask is kind of defined, what's the input, what's the output, are we delivering quality output to whoever we're delivering to? So that's also our customer. Um, an example that we show here is um, an activity that we did. It's actually a community service project where we um, were building bicycles. And of course, in our true fashion, we took the opportunity to relate it back to TPS and built in quality. 
So you can see we made work instructions. We set up a mock assembly line. Um, we actually broke the steps down so that we could use it for the team members who participated in the, the activity to kind of reinforce that thinking and it can be applied really to anything. Um, and it was kind of a fun way to get that thinking way instilled in them. Um, the actual activity that I was just explaining, kind of that step-by-step -step process breakdown, is actually called JKK, G Kote Kan Ketsu, for those of you who speak Japanese, that's terrible pronunciation probably. Um, anyway, this is um, our process of really thinking about how to break down each work element, how to define, again, input and output, and how to make sure that we're doing repeatably quality work and having good output. Um, so again, we, we train this practice um, in every aspect, not just manufacturing, to make sure that all of our team members kind of have that, that common thinking way and common culture. <coughs> the third area is around celebration. So we talked a little bit about that um, earlier that I mentioned Toyota really likes to find problems and we kind of celebrate it when we do. This is really um, a good example uh, for once a year as we go through the, the uh, calendar, we have a whole month dedicated to celebrating quality internally. Um, this is where we look at and try to find good examples across the company of having that kind of customer first thinking way. Um, it's an activity that um, each of our sites participate in, actually on the next one. We had um, all the manufacturing plants participate, R&D participates, headquarters participates. We make up slogans that you know have a contest to come up with the slogan for the year. Always again, kind of centered around that customer first thinking. We have themes each week, but uh, maybe most importantly, I think the example that I gave earlier, um, a quality catch is what it's called. So this is um, actually from our manufacturing side where we celebrate and recognize team members who find a quality problem that's not in their uh, responsible area. So for example, you know, three or four stations down the line, they're doing their work and they find something wrong. Um, if they're able to spot it and catch it before it goes out, we recognize those activities and then we kind of have a celebration and um, help those other team members, again, have that same thinking way to always be on the lookout, always be thinking about, of course, not only what you're doing, but what those around you have already done to uh, impact the customer in a positive way. Um, the last step of our quality strategy is sort of related to um, what we call planning, call planning. Uh, this is where we try to common, again, build on that culture, that common culture, but we um, set out uh, high level strategic objectives, uh, specifically in this case, in the quality area on a Hoshin. Uh, Hoshin is basically annual plan but it's not maybe your typical uh, basic targets and normal work. These are things that require some breakthrough activity, some cross-functional new team to accomplish it, um, and really set you up for what you're looking to accomplish more in the midterm. So in this case, uh, we are able to issue these um, quality of course stretches across every function in the organization. And so this is a naturally one of the cross-functional areas. And we have uh, planning workshops with those functional leaders in order to identify the big uh, common areas that we need to achieve as an organization from a quality perspective. We kind of track and manage that through uh, top level executive meetings that happen on a quarterly basis. Um, this is an example of one of those, the quality management meeting, quality meeting. And um, again, this is with our CQO and our top uh, senior executives in each of the functions. 
or we talk about those Hoshan items and strategic objectives that we've targeted for the year and make sure that they're progressing. Um, each of the teams, you know, kind of rotates and presents, but it's a chance to kind of learn from each other and again, make sure that we're staying on target to kind of break through on that item. And then finally, um, just to kind of, I guess, wrap it together, um, all of these sort of promote that um, year round kind of thinking about quality. So we don't want quality to be uh, something that we talk about or think about just once a year or twice a year when we report status. Um, we try to have activities that company wide that people can participate in, contribute to, um, recognize where good quality work is happening to sort of keep it in fresh and in front of everybody's mind uh, throughout the entire year. Again, our focus is really to, to think about and help our team members think about from a customer perspective. So I know today we're gonna to talk a little bit on the panel about metrics and things like that. So I'm kind of interested and in, uh, hopefully we'll get to share a little bit related to that perspective. But for us, almost, almost unequivocally, our metrics and perspective on quality is always judged from that end customer, meaning the person buying the vehicle. So um, even internally, everything gets connected back up to that. So this kind of year round thinking and refreshing of that thought process is really important to keep everybody's uh, focus on that. Um, even if this is not, you're not the actual person delivering the vehicle to the customer, um, we try to make it really obvious for each of our team members how their role connects to that end, end customer. And these are some of the activities, as I mentioned, that help us do that. I'm happy to take any questions before we go to panel. And uh, I'm, oh, yes, of course, please. is who is the customer? And in medicine, it may be the physician or the nurse who's using the, the device as opposed to the actual patient. I'm wondering in automotive world, do you consider the dealers and the servicemen customers as much as you do the drivers and buyers? Um, I don't know as much as, but we do. Um, so it's very common internally. Of course, when we say customer, everybody thinks the customer, the person buying the vehicle uh, internally. That's everyone's common understanding. However, when we talk about some of the things that I explained, the process breakdown and some of our um, thinking way and our culture, it's also who you're delivering your output to. So for example, our research team has a, two customers. The person who buys their car 10 years from now when their stuff is in the car and the development team that they hand their concepts off to to proceed the next step. The development teams have two customers, the person who buys the car and the manufacturing center who they deliver the design to to go into manufacturing and so on and so on. Manufacturing delivers to sales, sales delivers to the dealer, the dealer delivers to the market. So everybody knows that you know and that's a really fundamental answer but at least you have those two primary customers the end customer and your next in line internal customer and equally important if you break down the internal one the end customer is not going to get anything good so everyone kind of makes that connection internally mm -hmm. yep What prevents other companies from successfully adopting the Toyota way? Not one thing. <laughs> um, so uh, yesterday we talked a little bit about um, talking the talk and walking the walk. So um, if you go back, if I can figure out how to go back. So 
Sorry. That one. Um, this is not complicated, right? I mean, this is the two pillars. Um, but when you say continuous improvement, um, it really means continuous improvement. What that means is every day that you're doing your job, of course, you're doing lots of different things, but every job that you do, you think about how can I do it better? How can I make the output better? It's just a common way of thinking in the company that's rewarded, which perpetuates it, and encouraged um, from peers, stakeholders, supervisors. Same with respect for people. Again, these are not, you know, earth shattering concepts, but executing them has to be diligently done every day at every level and has to be recognized and rewarded when it happens. Um, otherwise, you're not gonna, that culture is not gonna take hold. And again, it's from the very top down to the lowest technician on the line. You know, it's everybody has this common thinking and it's part of, you know, bringing in our new members. We reinforce it through lots of different activities throughout the year, not just quality, but you know, many different aspects. But there's nothing preventing anybody from adopting this other than not doing it, not walking the walk. So just one quick follow on. Do you have to apply different strategies based on the national location of your facilities to account for different cultural norms that may or may not lend themselves to learning and applying the Toyota way? Um, your question is, do we have to? Um, we don't have to, but I think we do. We incorporate local, local and outside influence as much as we can. Um, that's one of the forms of continuous improvement. So, um, and honestly, that's probably the hardest thing. Um, and I, again, I think I heard it here, you know, that kind of inward thinking. We know we're the experts. We know that our spec is right. We know our process is good. We know, insert the blank, whatever you want to put there. Um, so it is hard to listen to outside local voices who come in with a different idea or a different approach. Um, but honestly, even though it's a struggle and we always try to do that, we're not perfect at that, certainly. Um, I think that's an area for us of continuous improvement. We need to do it more. We need to be more open to those ideas. And I think as we move into this mobility uh, functionality, we're seeing that more and more because we're interacting with different partners, different companies, different experts that you know, aren't traditional automotive. So it's really opening our perspective up to different ways and different methodology to develop our products. Please. Oh, can I? Can I sure, sure. You? Sorry. As I told you last night, I grew up in Flint, Michigan, which used to be, and that's an important statement, used to be the headquarters of General Motors. Mm. My father worked for General Motors. All seven of my brothers worked in the uh, U.S. manufacturing for, for automotive industry. And uh, they think it's really funny that I'm in quality in, in, in a different industry because their perception of quality comes from what they learned at, mm. at General Motors. Um, and the used to be has to do with the fact that Toyota kicked GM's ass <laughs> in the late 80s, okay? And put them out of business pretty much because of the quality issue. My question for you, and it strikes me as I look at what you have here and thinking about how my brothers view what I do, um, quality is not just the guy at the end of the hall who, who checks the work and says, no, you can't ship, all right, at, at Toyota, I can see that. How is it that you get quality not to be just my job as the functional leader, but to be everyone's job? What are, what are some of the things about the Toyota Way that allow every single employee to do the quality work that needs to be done? Mm. Yeah, it's a, um, again, I think that's another great example of our continuous improvement. So, um, you know, certainly the people in the quality organization are very attuned to 
um, the, as you described, you know, that auditing function and check function. Um, a lot of our evaluation members also, it's kind of a natural thing. But for the members, for example, I'm just gonna make, pull one out, you know, accounting and finance. Do, do they understand? Well, you think, oh, that's not really their role, but um, the accuracy and uh, timeliness and um, quality of their output affects the rest of the organization. So what we try to explain, no matter what function you're in, is again, kind of going back to that breaking down the process and who is your next customer, not that end customer, but your next customer. Um, who are you delivering your output to? If you have garbage in to their process, they're going to make garbage out. And eventually <laughs> that will work its way out of the company to the customer. So we try to, again, connect each person to delivering their output in that quality manner and connect it eventually back to that final ultimate end customer. It is different in how you measure that quality and how you um, recognize it. And certainly the impact, you know, maybe if you're way upstream of the, the end customer, sometimes there's much more opportunity to catch those before they snowball into a bigger problem. But um, regardless, it's kind of that thinking way that we explain and train into our employees right from the very beginning that they need to think about, are they getting good inputs and are they giving good outputs for what their task is? Can you talk a little bit about what the changes have been since the, the crisis, as you called it? Mm -hmm. So how, has qual how is quality viewed beforehand and how is quality viewed today? And can you <laughs> tell us a little more about what's changed? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, the first, I think the biggest change is um, prior to the recall crisis, um, it was a much more centralized function globally with uh, much more of the uh, management, tracking, much of the decision making happening overseas at the parent company. Um, after the recall crisis, uh, we were, um, I guess we took the stance, the company took the stance that it was a much we required a much more decentralized view of quality to be closer to the consumer that we were servicing. So um, certainly we had mechanisms in place and our role was to gather that information and make sure that it was being sent back to the parent company prior to the crisis. Um, but still you can imagine, you know, they're separated. They're not feeling the situation that's happening. They're not interacting directly with the dealers. And no matter how much we explain or data or that we provide, it, there's no substitute for actually being face-to-face -face with your consumer that's struggling with the product you're giving them. So um, we really took a much more decentralized approach globally, not only for North America, but Europe, Asia, everywhere, and gave that autonomy to the local quality uh, functions to do some of that, um, not some of it, all of it, um, tracking and management and decision making about when do we need to recall products, when do we need to put out, you know, service and all kinds of different things related to quality in the field. So um, that's probably the biggest change point for us, that centralized versus decentralized. And of course, as such, we had to create, you know, the, the management structure with including our regional CQO to, to have that authority to make those decisions locally. Um, probably another big change point, um, and this is more kind of working level, was, uh, again, it's kind of that recommitment to this model. Um, again, we talk, it's easy to talk the talk 
and over time, you know, you think you're doing it and you think you're following these good principles, but um, clearly we had lost our commitment to listening. I think I mentioned earlier. So we do much more activity to garner in the voice of the customer and as much as possible, you know, direct feedback, meaning, um, of course, we survey ourselves with third parties and things like that, but um, we have much more members out in the field, many more face-to-face um, -face kind of discussions and kind of that personalized, actually listening to what they're telling us and kind of eliminating that middleman so that the people who need to take action to fix things are getting the information directly from the field. So those are maybe two big fundamental things that I feel like are really significantly different after the crisis. Hi, I have a question from one of our, our online viewers. Sure. Um, so, you know, a lot of the folks here, I know we, I told you a little bit about who, who was coming to this event today, but a lot of our, our folks here have spent their careers in quality and, and someone, one of our online viewers noted, noted that you actually came from an R&D background. I'm wondering <laughs> if you can speak to how that kind of influenced how, well, first of all, how did you get from one to the other and, and uh, how did that influence how you kind of approach the role now that you're in a quality role? Um, so I, I can tell you as R&D, I had to work a lot with quality, which should tell you about my competency in R&D. No, just kidding. Um, anyway, our, our research and development leg um, actually works really closely with our quality team. So all throughout my career, um, I had worked with a lot of the quality members. Um, and of course, with the quality crisis, um, I was really working with the quality members during that time. Um, but it is completely different being now in, of course, in charge of quality. So um, I get to carry the stick instead of avoiding the stick, I guess. Um, but it is a, it is a quite a different, I guess, experience to have that responsibility. Um, it's interesting for me mainly because um, in my R&D experience, you know, you, you're very localized what you understand about quality. It's related to the product, of course, that you're developing um, or the projects you're developing. And you're trying to always um, meet your quality target or hit your quality uh, KPI. But from the quality side, what we're looking at is how do we keep challenging KPIs to keep kind of pushing ourselves closer and closer to that customer expectation? How do we gather the right information so that we set the right KPIs to hit their expectation? Um, these are the kind of things that we're continuously thinking about. And then how do we communicate those out and set appropriate targets both for R&D, for manufacturing, for the other functions in the company that feed into those functions so that our, again, our end products are um, exceeding customers expectation. So it's, it's a completely different um, perspective, but I think because I was in R&D, I do have a good appreciation for um, those metrics and how important they are. Now it's kind of the other side of how do I continuously keep making those more and more challenging or again, more and more focused on what the customer needs are. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, kind of the strong relationship, work relationship between R&D and quality and having been on both sides of that fence, what do you guys do to build, maintain that collaborative but challenging each other relationship that you have, but knowing that you are in two separate functions? That's a good question. Um, we actually have uh, teams embedded on both sides. So um, our quality organization works um, part of our standard development um, schedule um, process is uh, that at the very early stage, even at the conceptual stage of a vehicle, um, quality members join that activity. They um, weigh in with their expertise about the target setting um, performance wise 
and kind of highlight areas of the design or the concept that may be potentially shortfall of what the customers expect. And at each of the major milestones throughout development, quality is participating and kind of evaluating the progress to those targets that are set to hit that, that customer expectation, as well as feeding back, oh, you know, the market's changing, the expectation is shifting, we need to change the target. And of course, judging, you know, auditing and checking that it's happening all throughout the development life cycle from very concept stage all the way till the cars roll out of the manufacturing center. So the teams are, um, I'll say, co-located and kind of embedded to work together right from the very start and at each of those stages. Um, other than that, when we have teams that are, I'll say, doing more um, kind of research or system development rather than product, meaning the car. Um, we also have quality members embedded in those teams as advisors of what is necessary to meet the customer expectation. So a lot of times in R&D, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. We can do this or this, or if we do this, we got to take this. It's always that kind of a discussion. So quality is really invaluable in those um, decision-making areas to understand, well, you can do this, but if you take this or you prioritize this lower, you know, what's the impact to the customer going to be? From their um, kind of knowledge of not only our product, but also the competitive products out there. I have another question from one of our online viewers. Um, when thinking about risk management with, within Toyota, what's the kind of what are some of the considerations? Are you thinking about safety risk versus consumer satisfaction risk, and and how do you kind of scale and prioritize the different risks that you have within within? Um, okay, so um, it's sorry, I I'm struggling a little bit with the question. It's we never prioritize anything but safety first. <laughs> so um, everything else below that, there's you know, always trade-offs, but that one is there's no compromising on it. Um, of course, some of the safety items are regulated to us and some of them are self-regulated to, our, to ourselves. Um, you know, just this is our standard and we're not gonna, we're not gonna change that. So um, when we're having the discussions about that, um, those items are kind of, okay, that's the basis. We're not changing those items. And then, uh, of course, some of the other items, um, especially lately, maybe a good example for us, um, and for those of you who follow J.D. Power, um, you'll have seen the results last week or last, last week. Um, anyway, those results show that we still are struggling. So, you know, I know I'm talking up here like, oh, the holy grail of quality, but um, we're still struggling with quality. Uh, the areas, some of the areas that we're still working through are things that aren't maybe that traditional quality, like it's broken. Uh, broken, we, we can pretty much manage, um, but I just don't like the way it works. Is really hard um, and requires a lot of information from the market that is continuously changing and being set by products outside of automotive. So um, again, if you look through the JD Power, you'll see some of the systems that we're struggling with are more the consumer electronics type interfaces. And um, the industry as a whole is struggling, but Toyota is really struggling. I feel like we're just not capturing that customer voice enough. So, I mean, there's areas that we still need to work on. And I think when we're prioritizing, we're always looking for those kind of things. Um, where, where are we weak? And we look at those kind of surveys or we look at our internal information to try to understand, but still it's a struggle. Quick question on, um, right, obviously it's a global company. You make products for countries all over the world. And one of the challenges that 
we have as a company is uh, getting our head around is market appropriate products. Uh, so, you know, a product that might be desired in the US may have different requirements in India or China. Or, totally different. Uh, and that comes to in terms of customer preference, but in terms of safety standards, mm -hmm. um, there's different levels of safety requirements depending on what part of the world you're in and uh, what, what, what's enforced by the government. Do you build product to one common safety standard for Toyota or does that, um, I guess, does that bar change depending on the, the country that you're selling the product mm -hmm. into? Yep, it's a good question. So um, most definitely um, there's variation country to country. Uh, our objective is to try to commonize that as much as possible just to reduce production variation. But um, we have to be practical about it. So for example, there are specifications required in the Middle East. Um, I'm, I'm just making an example um, that are required in the Middle East from when we say safety, it's kind of related to you know, temperature and environmental kind of usage that require certain types of parts and systems and powertrains and all kinds of things um, that are much over the spec that's required in the United States. So it's at that moment that we have to sort of decide, is it beneficial? And of course, Middle East volume is very small. North America volume, I'm just, again, this is just an example, very large. So do we commonize the spec, which is maybe much up spec for Middle East, which means you're up specking in a large volume market, or do we not have common spec and only apply it where it's necessary? So it really depends system by system. Safety related, um, we've sort of taken a little different approach. That's maybe the one area that we commonize. Um, if it's good for safety, it's good for safety. So um, we have kind of standard systems um, that we apply globally. They're the Toyota Safety Sense and the Lexus can't think of the name of it. Anyway, similar thing for Lexus. You know, it's a suite of features related to safety and it's common globally. So safety is probably the one area that we don't think about that trade-off, at least not yet. Depending on how regulations go, European regulations on safety are, tend to be a little forward of North America. Um, so, you know, we're still watching it, but generally speaking, safety is the one area that we don't kind of balance that or prioritize or change, but all the other specifications are really case by case. Hi, so I'm hearing a lot. I mean, we're all hearing a lot about the voice of the customer quality, bringing in the voice of the customer, even in, you know, early on in concept development, who is responsible or what function is responsible for manufacturability. So, you know, you have a concept, but we can't possibly make it, you know, that kind of a yep. thing. Is uh, that quality? It's a great question. Um, so I probably didn't explain that well. Um, we, our approach at the early stage of the development, um, from the time we get the handover of the technologies from the research leg or the advanced development legs of the company into the main development, <laughs> Um, teams, those development teams are made up of a cross-functional uh, group. It includes manufacturing, production engineering, quality, purchasing, engineering, evaluation. Did I say quality? Quality, you know, I mean, all of, all of them are represented. So they're there at the concept stage working with the chief engineer who decides the specification for the product and um, sets the um, targets, performance targets, um, and quality targets as a team of what we're trying to achieve for that new product introduction. Then throughout the development life cycle, anywhere from 36 to 48 months-ish, um, which is kind of long, I know that's kind of long, um, we're trying to shorten it. Anyway, around 36 months, um, 
there's you know multiple milestone meetings so that cross functional team is continuously meeting maybe every couple weeks and then at the milestone meetings they have to report progress to those targets at every step if at any one of those milestones we're not hitting the targets and the targets are a combination of quality performance manufacturability production engine, you know, do we have the right tooling? Do we need new tooling technology? All those things are targets. Each function has their own targets, but they combine all of those, report out at each milestone. At any milestone, if we are not hitting those targets, the project stops until we come up with a solution to hit that target. So if that means we're not gonna hit our start of production, that means we're not gonna hit the start of production. So um, there's a lot of pressure as we move along. That's the purpose of those milestones to kind of bring issues to the surface where we're not hitting our targets and make some breakthrough or make some direction or decision how we're gonna proceed so that we can keep the project on schedule. Yes, um, that's a good point, thank you. So um, the last step before we go to market, um, although it's design handing over to manufacturing and manufacturing handing over to sales to sell to the customer, that final step before we hand over to sales, there is a decision meeting, the final, final meeting that is my responsibility, every car that we launch, I have to agree and authorize it to launch to market. So if any of the metrics aren't met or any of the processes aren't working properly or any of the suppliers aren't capable in providing sustained product, anything like that, shop floor, design, anything, we stop and we don't sell. So yes. Um, yeah, um, so that's actually, thank you for reminding me about that. I, in my new assignment, I often, we have, we've only had two so far this year, so um, not too many yet, but, but anyway, each time we launch a product, that's quality's responsibility to authorize it to market. Given the case for a quality program that some of us are here for, I'm interested in for Toyota, do you have an internal appraisal methodology that you use or an external one similar to CMMI that can help you guys get that outside view about opportunities for continuous improvement? Mm. Um, so the external sources that we use, again, um, from a quality perspective, we're measuring um, mostly customer satisfaction. So it's the whole product and the whole process of acquiring the product, meaning the sales experience, the finance experience, the delivery experience, the actual thing that they bought, all the feature functions inside. Um, and those third parties are looking at um, every aspect of that and giving us feedback. It's kind of up to us to trace that back to where it um, is owned within the overall development. But internally, how we're measuring you know, some of our quality metrics, um, we don't typically have outside auditors. Look, is that what you're kind of asking? Auditors or appraisals. Yeah, yeah. we typically are doing that um, on our own. Although um, we do have a global standard and methodology about how that's done. So it's the framework of that system is a, a global system for Toyota. So it's relatively similar in Japan and North America and Europe with all of the you know, basic methodology and uh, processes to do that. Uh, I don't think we have outside any audit of that. I mean, they're continuously looking at ways to improve it, but I think it's an internal okay. um, audit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. See, I don't know. That's only. 
Getting back to your launch discussions, do you or does Toyota incentivize hitting launch dates and schedules and <coughs> post-quality launch metrics? Um, incentivize meaning or from our financial incentive? Yeah, bonuses, whatever. Mm, loosely, yes. Um, when I say it that way, um, our um, incentives are based on overall company performance, not individual product launches. So if we delay or we have a poor quality launch, that'll affect the performance, company level performance, sales, profitability, you know, those kind of things. So at the executive level, that is a factor in compensation, but um, generally speaking, although I, I think I've only experienced in my time at Toyota, the vehicles that I've worked on or participated in, the times that we've delayed a launch, I can probably count on one hand. I, there's been a few, but it's very rare that we delay. So our milestone management is rigorous. <laughs> So, and very strict. Um, and there's lots of sub uh, milestones leading up to each one, but the whole purpose of it and the whole activity is exactly to, okay, at this milestone, we're gonna check these 10 things. If these 10 things aren't meeting criteria, we're stopping. So there is a lot of the interim milestones that get delayed, um, but always, always, almost always we uh, don't delay the final launch. And certainly again, um, we have launched with some uh, less than perfect quality launches. Uh, naturally, things will happen. Um, unanticipated things that the customer, you know, doesn't like how it works or we didn't, you know, test it enough that we didn't find this thing that, you know, this switch works differently than they thought it was, all those kind of issues. But, um, there's no direct, direct incentive about that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Other than our hurted, our hurt pride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, one more question from our, our online viewers. Sure. I think this question will resonate with a lot of our, um, a lot of the folks here in the room. So at Toyota, what is the primary role of quality? Is it ensuring compliance or improving product and process quality or something else? Uh, primary role. Our primary role is delivering products and services that meet the customer expectations. Um, compliance is, of course, uh, mandatory, required, uh, obviously. But um, I think we mentioned yesterday, um, and everyone in the room was like, uh, for, for us, compliance is like this. <laughs> kind of bare minimum, like we, we don't, I mean, we think about it, obviously we think about it, but um, it's, it's not something that's the primary thinking. We just know that's gonna happen. That's the basis of customers buying vehicles. If, if we had customers or uh, products going out, us or our competitors that were non-compliant, you know, the industry just kind of crumbles apart, right? So customers, the compliance kind of sets up that basic customer confidence that they're gonna go buy any car anywhere and it's not gonna blow up or you know, stop running or whatever. Um, but the differentiator in the quality space is how much you go above that kind of compliance. So um, I think we talked about, you know, kind of for us, it's, we're kind of indifferent, you know, compliance is just compliance. That's just the requirement. And we don't, again, we think about it, but we don't um, spend as much time as you probably think, because it's just expected. Uh, that's a given foundation kind of a thing. So I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think that answers the question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, Kristen. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.